After the excitement in my bedroom, I needed a stiff drink, so I elected to take a brandy in the hotel restaurant while Morrissey tried out a suitable moustache. It was during this libation that a curious fellow from Cornwall tried to get my attention. Who are? I ignored him, as was both my want and as proper. Who are? Excuse me, but I do not wish to be disturbed, especially not by the likes of you. The Cornish gentleman, although I'm not sure such people are truly gentle, prodded me with his ornate cane. Who are? Be gone, vile Miss Crane, before I summon the constabulary and send you back to the pirate hinterland from which you came. Stickle, it is me. My jaw dropped. Behind that Cornish moustache was indeed Lord Morrissey Morrissey, cunningly disguised. Morrissey, why, I never. The illusion is perfect. Indeed. Now fix your moustache and let us see what the real Archibald and Mary Cat have in store. Morrissey signalled the maitre d' to usher us to our table, which was a tight and dark alcove over the very back of the restaurant. I, for only a moment, thought this was hardly appropriate seating for both a lord and a postmaster general, but I quickly came to my senses. We were about to surveil two men who had previously broken into my room. Discretion was the better part of an Alderthrop dinner. Ah, here come the two scoundrels now. Through the restaurant door came two heavily bandaged figures. One was tall, the other stocky. They were, in height and build, the very men who had recently jumped out my bedroom window. The worse for wear, too. Good, good. Morrissey stroked his false moustache thoughtfully. I have taken the liberty of ordering our food ahead of time, Pluddles. I wish for us to be neither seen nor heard. My heart sunk a little. Morrissey would have ordered the fish for both of us. He was always on about improving my mental capacities through the digestion of seafood. If his lordship had his way, I'd eat nothing but sturgeon's eggs for breakfast, salmon for lunch, and some curious antipodean fish called snapper for my tea. Our food arrived, and we waited for quite some time in silence before one of the men began to speak. So, let us get down to business. That pest Lord Morrissey and his latest monkey seem to have discovered something about our plans here in Alderthrop. I can't imagine that they're here by accident. Are we safe to talk, then? I should think so. The only unusual characters here tonight are two business travellers, someone from Cornwall and a Frenchman. We should be able to talk business. My disguise was an undoubtable success. So, do you think that they know about the Wednesday Protocol? I doubt it very much. When the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the ex-Chancellor, was last here, Morrissey was unaware of his contingency plan. Rather, I suspect he simply saw that ridiculous advertisement in the newspaper and put two and two together to get three. Still, it would be wise for us to be cautious. I believe they visited the ruins earlier this afternoon. If Morrissey spotted... Even if he did, he does not know how to enter the crypt. That secret died with Stickle. <clears throat> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. That secret died with the former Chancellor of the Exchequer. Most unfortunately. But our brothers and sisters have managed to reconstruct the general scope of it from the hints he left in his diaries, thank God. I blanched at this blasphemy. Morrissey believed the official theory that they'd been burnt by Stickle before his sad demise. Morrissey, I've been told, does have a tendency to uncritically accept the words of the authorities. But enough of the snide chit-chat. If we are to access the crypt before his lordship discovers our plot, we will need to act quickly. Yes, with the general election being held next weekend, we haven't much time to lose. To tomorrow morning. With this, they set about eating noisily. I say, Morrissey, I whispered, this all seems very rum. His lordship's face was strained. I fear, Puddles, that I have made not just a grave error of judgment, but a succession of them. How so, Morrissey? I thought the Stickle affair had come to a close when he drowned in the well outside of Glasgow. But it seems I merely delayed his dastardly plot. Morrissey stood upright and pushed his meal to one side. Puddles, we must return to that churchyard tonight. Whatever those ruffians seek, we must find first. I will not be fooled again. I followed Morrissey towards the restaurant door, all the while catching the eye of the maitre d'. As two men of the lower ranks, we knew the common signs and codes which allowed us to coexist with high society. As such, I signalled to him wordlessly that I desired a beef and gravy sandwich with thick-cut bread and lard rather than butter. With a flutter of my eyelids, I indicated that it must be delivered to my room immediately. With luck, tonight's meal would not be quite the disaster after all. The Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, brought to you today by Josh Addison and Dr. M. Denton. You're listening to the podcaster's guide to the conspiracy. I am Josh Edison in Auckland, New Zealand. They are Dr. M. Dentith in Hamilton, New Zealand. Uh, I'm locked down. How about you?
No, things are free and easy here in Kiri Kiriuroa. We can go out to bars, we can mingle, we can hug. We don't even have to social distance. Although we should. Yes. We just don't have to. Hmm. Whereas we wear masks but don't have to or something. I don't know. I can work from home so I don't venture outside the house anyway. Ah, but you have dirty children that bring the illnesses into you. Well, that's true, yes, but not the COVID so far. I haven't I haven't been for a COVID test yet. I kind of should have because I had a bit of a head cold and they say if you have head cold symptoms you should get yourself tested just as a matter of course. But then the day after I woke up, well, sorry, the, the morning I woke up feeling better like the head cold had passed was the day we went into level three lockdown. And that was also the day when queues at testing facilities suddenly stretched on forever and people were spending eight hours waiting to get tested. And I thought, ah, yeah, no, I, I really don't want to do that. But the, kind, the thing is, though, two years ago now, I had, a, I had an operation on my sinuses. I think I must have had a week off the podcast or something when it happened. And um, so I've had, I've had metal fiber optic probes shoved up my sinuses and sort of curved hooky things sucking out blood clots and shit. So I kind of want to take a test just so that I can say, a cotton bud, come back to me when it's a curved metal hook. But um, that's probably not the best, probably not the best motivation. You heard it here, folks. Josh is patient zero and he refuses to be tested. Basically. But um, but uh, things have been a little more interesting for you in these in these times of misinformation and uncertainty and con- swirling conspiracy theories. You seem to have have sporulated like a fungus and just sort of just sort of settled gently across the length and breadth of New Zealand's media. Where where, where have you shown up lately? Because it's been a lot. Well, so I've been in an article in Newsroom, which was written by Mark Dalder. I appeared in a bonus episode of the One of Two Hundred podcast, an article and stuff. I was on Magic Talk Radio, and when I got the phone call from the producer saying, "Hey, I'm a producer from Magic Talk." Now, for those of you people living overseas, Magic Talk Radio is kind of the worst of talk back in this country, and so I was afraid the producer would say, "So, Sean wants to talk to you." That would be Sean Plunkett, one of our worst broadcasters, or. Peter Williams, who used to be a very respected sports broadcaster, and has turned into a terrible talkback host. But no, it was lo and behold, it was Graham Hill, who was actually one of our better radio DJs slash interviewers, because he used to, ha- well, probably still does, hold a whole bunch of skeptic discussions online. So I was going, oh yeah, I'll talk with Graham. Graham's great. And I'm also going to be on a podcast at attached to the TV3 TV show, The Project. So basically, I've done about one media interview a day for the last week. And frankly, I'm just all over the place now. John Hmm. Drennan will hate me. Yes. Well, you heard it here first. Dr. M. Dentith is hot property. Hot media property. It's true. Mm. I am definitely of the moment. Yes. Um, But we're not going to talk about any of that today. Uh, we're, we're having another episode of Conspiracy Theory Masterpiece Theatre, and like the one of, not last time, but I think the time before, it's another short and sweet one. Um, in fact, it's a very even, short and sweet one. E- Less even than shorter and sweeter words. than the last. Mm. So, uh, in fact, it's so short that I'm not going to introduce it at all before the bit, because that will just eat up valuable, eat up time that we could spend talking about the thing itself when there's little enough to talk about as it is. So I think we should just dive straight in. Indeed. Play that sting. Quality sting. It's a fortress around my heart. Mm. What we're going to be talking about today is appealing to the fundamental attribution error. Was it all a big mistake? Question mark. Uh, By Steve Clark, published in Conspiracy Theories, The Philosophical Debate, 2006. Which was Um, the first edited collection of... The Philosophical Work on Conspiracy Theories, edited by David Cody. And it's quite an interesting book, because it's not just pieces that had been written previously, it's also replies or expansion on those pieces. So the piece we're looking at by Steve Clark is a response to the criticisms of his earlier paper on Conspiracy Theories, where he's going, look, I've been criticized about appealing to the fundamental attribution error 
in this chapter, I'm going to explain where I went wrong and also possibly where I might still be right. So it's quite a fascinating book because it comes out quite early in the philosophical literature on conspiracy theories. So the pe people involved, uh, your Lee Bashams, your Charles Pickdoms, your David Cody's, your Steve Clark, Neil Levy, whose work we'll be getting onto fairly soon. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. I got very emotional because I tried to choke myself to death. Hmm. But this this chapter is a reply to a reply and a slight retraction of a view. Hmm. Now, just a little recap. Um, if you don't recall, back, I, th I think it was nine episodes when we first talked about his first paper, Conspiracy Theories and Conspiracy Theorizing. That was the one, or one, one of the several ones that was a, re a reaction to Brian L. Keeley. Um, and it was the one where um, Steve Clark, is he a Steve or a Stephen? I believe it's Steve, as far as I'm aware. Steve. Hmm. Um, first of all, uh, disagreed basically with Kelly and took quite a different tack from some of the other ones that we've seen, whereas he, he said that um, Kelly is, is wrong, that the things that Kelly says about his unwarranted conspiracy theories aren't really the reason why they're unwarranted. The problem with them is actually a problem with the conspiracy theorists who cling to them, and he was largely interested in these... Um, in, in the phenomenon of people who continue to stick to their conspiracy theories even after they don't appear to be uh, warranted at all. Yeah, so this um, is an example of someone who is very focused on the psychological nature mm. of conspiracy theorists. So Steve doesn't deny that conspiracies occur or that conspiracy theories can be warranted. His worry is that there's a class of person out there who has a kind of irrational belief in conspiracy theories, the conspiracy theorists, and he's concerned with diagnosing that problem. Hmm. Which almost sounds a little bit ad hominem-y, but I suppose it's not really. We, we, we sort of think, we, we, uh, I sort of have the knee-jerk response when you hear, so, so you mean they're attacking the person, not their argument, but um, that's not really what's going on, is it? Is there, there's, there's a little more in-depth. Yes, I mean, it's... It's a contentious point in the philosophical literature because it all depends on how you're defining who counts as being a conspiracy theorist. So if you follow Charles Pigton, as I do, you go, well, look, anyone who is historically or politically literate believes in the not just the existence of conspiracies, but will believe at least one conspiracy theory. Ipso facto, we are all conspiracy theorists. And so the term actually uh, applies to the general class of these things called conspiracy theories. While well, Steve is going, no, actually, we, when we talk about conspiracy theorists, we're talking about a particular kind of person who tend to believe conspiracy theories for bad reasons. And so if you're a Pigsonian, a Pigginator, a Pignonian, I'm trying to work out how you'd actually mm. make Pigden into... No, if, if you're a follower of Dewey, you're a Dewean. If you're a follower of Kant, you're a Kantian. So if you're a follower of Pigton, you're a pigeon. Sounds good to me. If you're one of the people who follows Pigton on these particular issues, you go, well, no, actually, conspiracy theory isn't a pejorative, sorry, conspiracy theorist isn't a pejorative term, so we shouldn't be referring to them in this kind of narrow subclass. Well, Steve is going, no, actually, when we talk about conspiracy theorists, we're talking about a rather unusual group with a psychological problem, and we need to diagnose that problem. Mm. Um, now, David Cody, as we saw last time, I think, um, basically took issue with... Oh, no, hang on, sorry, I'm jumping ahead, because, of course, the, the, the specific psychological um, uh, flaw that... Clark diagnoses sort of these conspiracy theorists with is that they are committing the fundamental attribution error, um, which is a psychological phenomenon where people have been seen to favor dispositional explanations of things over situational explanations of things. So dispositional is more, how would you describe it, facts about people, whereas situation is facts about the situations that those people are in. Yes, so, I mean, when I do deal with this in my work, I think of dispositions more with respect to the way we talk about intention. So people who 
favor dispositional explanations think that intentions play a much bigger role in explanations of complex social phenomena than situations people are in. Now, of course, the problem with the FAE, the fundamental attribution error, is not that people don't have dispositional explanations. The question is the balance of dispositions or intentions versus situations. And so as we're going to see in this discussion, the initial evidence that the fundamental attribution error applies to the case of the conspiracy theory, and thus the conspiracy theorist, may not be as easily generalizable as Clark made it out to be in his earlier piece. No. Yes, now as I was going to say before I forgot I'd set up the hadn't set up the actual main points, David Cody, when he looked at it, basically just argued against the fundamental attribution error itself. Um, he didn't didn't have a lot to say from what I can recall, uh, other than to sort of kind of disagree with the evidence for it, uh, but then also made a point which we'll go into more uh, shortly as we go through this, that often people who appeal to the fundamental attribution error are actually committing the fundamental attribution error themselves, so it starts to look a lot more dodgy. But um, I guess we should actually start talking about the paper that we're wanting to talk about today. Whose turn is it to do the abstract? Is it me or is it you? Oh, I haven't I think it's me. Been, I think I, it's me. I haven't been... Yeah, I, yeah, let's just say it's you, because I let's have not it's been me. keeping score. Right. So the opening paragraph of the paper appealing to the fundamental attribution error was it all a big mistake reads... In conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorizing, I argued that we're entitled to an attitude of prima facie skepticism to the theories propounded by conspiracy theorists. Many commentators, such as Keeley, might agree that we're entitled to such an attitude because conspiracy theorists are advocates of conspiracy theories, and they allege a significant class of conspiracy theories have fatal epistemic deficiencies. However, my approach was not to find fault with conspiracy theories, but to focus on the psychology of those conspiracy theorists who fail to abandon conspiracy theories when these theories have taken on the appearance of what Lakatos referred to as degenerating research programs. Which seemed a little... I mean, as, as it goes forward, I suppose it is more accurate, but the, the, the fact that it starts with saying, characterizing Keeley as saying, we're entitled to an attitude because conspiracy theorists are advocates of conspiracy theories, which can be dodgy... Whereas I thought the whole point was that Keeley didn't really look at conspiracy theorists at all and focused entirely on conspiracy. That, it seems like he's sort of casting the problem to favour his way of looking at it in the first place. I think this also fits into a long-standing issue that people have misinterpreted Keeley to a very large extent over the course of the literature, and maybe a necessary corrective needs to be published to remind people of what Keeley actually said as opposed to how people have misinterpreted Keeley over time. Hmm. But anyway, as, as he says, he, his, his approach is to focus on the psychology of the conspiracy theorists, and in particular, um, the fundamental attribution era, or FAE, as it's mostly all the way through, because that's a little bit easier, um, is the thing that they all have in common. That's, that, that's the fallacy that they all uh, fall into. Um, so continuing to, and again, I think when we looked at that one, the, the little paper of, was it Brian Keeley? I think that we looked at a couple of times ago, that was sort of six pages long and only really in the last page did he actually say something new, having summarized everything leading up to there. This one's kind of the same. It's about three pages long and the actual new material comes in about halfway down the last page. So we're still sort of summarizing what's come before. Um, he I mean, says, although there's a, there's a bit of contextualization here. So... What Clark does in this chapter is go, look, I said the FAE is a likely candidate for explaining why we are suspicious about the psychology of conspiracy theorists. I have to now admit, speaking in Clark's voice, that the evidence for the FAE is nowhere near as strong as I made it out to be at the time. So the first, say, two-thirds of the paper is a actually the FAE isn't quite as generalizable in a broad sense as maybe I thought it was, and here's why. Mm. Yes, yes. So he starts looking at the FAE. He says, um, the FAE is an error involving a bias in favor of dispositional explanations, appeal to character traits, attitudes, and the like, and a uh, corresponding bias against situational explanations. 
uh, in Clark 2002, that's his previous paper, I followed Ross and Nisbet in arguing that the FAE is a very widespread phenomenon. However, a deeper acquaintance with evidence for the FAE leads me to experience two sorts of doubts about the case for a pervasive FAE. And then, yes, as you say, he looks into the idea that maybe the fundamental attribution era isn't actually as widespread as we think it is, and therefore maybe isn't as good a candidate for explaining um, explaining away uh, unwarranted conspiracy theories. And one of these rationales, because Clark talks about two, is that actually it might be the choice of examples that social psychologists use which are misleading, and that social psychologists tend to focus on particular situations that are of interest to them, but it's not clear that just because we find the effect in one situation, that this can be then generalized to all situations that psychological or epistemic agents experience. Yes, yeah, so he, he, he basically looks at the... In the past, he, he appealed to um, experimental evidence, the, these, these um, experiments uh, undertaken by social psychologists. Um, the ones were about sort of, you know, whether or not a person stops to help someone and then whether or not they stop to help someone when they're in a hurry and people's attitudes towards them and so on. Um, but yes, as he says, there are... Um, there are sorts of situations that social psychologists are, are, are interested in, um, and those are the ones that they conduct experiments on, but they don't appear to have sort of looked for the FAE across what you might call a sort of broad range of, of human experience, across a, a sort of general um, set of situations. So maybe there isn't actually evidence to say that it's something that crops up a lot in all situations all the time. Maybe it's something that is possibly common in the scenarios that they actually look at, but not so common in other ones. Um, so and he sort of says, you know, th th there's tons of experimental evidence here, lots of experience being done. Um, he's not going to uh, spent his time here going through them all. He just sort of points out that this does appear to be the case. And then he gets on to his second problem, <clears throat> where he says, and I quote, The second problem with the case for the FAE is that there may be dispositional explanations available that can account for many of the FAE experiments which proponents of the FAE have attributed to the power of situational factors. So he's kind of, I guess, undercutting what those experiments possibly show and that even when it looks like people situational factors were the, uh, the, the 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 guiding thing maybe it was actually dispositional factors all along and people aren't making a mistake when they assume that dispositional factors are the salient ones am i getting that right yes yeah, so the example that he uses which is actually cody's criticism of clark is the famous seminarian example so this is an example which actually I remember being taught back in secondary school by, of all things, a Catholic priest in what used to be called Christian living and then became religious education, which was an experiment where a whole bunch of people training for the priesthood are told, you're about to go and attend a class on the Good Samaritan, but they're told, look, you're actually, we've run over time, you're running late, you need to get to class really quickly. And so all of these trainee priests suddenly run out of class and they bypass someone who's lying on the ground and needs help. And people took this to be an example of you put people into a particular situation of getting them to hurry from one space to another, and even though they should be primed to have the disposition, given they've been told that they're about to attend their class on the Good Samaritan, they should have the disposition to take care of people in distress they see around them, because of the situation they're in, they rush past. And as Cody points out, and as many critics of the FAE have pointed out, there actually might be a disposition in operation there, which is, it's rude and embarrassing to be late. So the disposition of hurrying to class is actually part of, sorry, the, the situation of hurrying to class also carries with it the disposition, I don't want to be embarrassed, and thus that actually might be playing the role. Now, the argument here isn't that the disposition trumps the situation. The argument here is we don't know exactly what's going on in this situation. If you only cast it in situational factors, then you can bring the disposition in. 
in the same respect, if you cast the entire story as a dispositional explanation, someone could say, but what about the situation? We literally don't know what's going on here. He also uh, points out in a footnote that um, the fundamental attribution era seems to be more of a Western phenomenon um, and that, that in similar experiments in other cultures don't necessarily show the results um, that we've seen in our cultures. Um, and I know this is something... I, I know very little about the field of psychology and experimentation and so on, but I've, I've heard it said that it's a problem in psychology with these sorts of experiments that they tend to not have a super representative sample and that a lot of these experiments are conducted at universities and therefore their subjects are university students because they're the ones who are nearby and willing to participate. And university students aren't necessarily a representative cross-section of society. Um, I know there's that project, isn't there, of trying to um, replicate uh, replicate the results of famous um, experiments, and they've had fairly patchy success in the past? Yes, there is what's called the replication crisis going on in psychology at the moment, because, yes, a lot of the famous experiments are meant to show X applies to psychological agents either have never been tested again, or it turns out that when you look at the tests, the tests or the replications are, as you say, small sample sizes made up of university students and thus not generalizable to the entire human population. And when you start testing bigger sample sizes, which are more diverse, the effect that people saw in controlled environment often ends up being a, a lot more amorphous than people initially thought. Mm. So, yeah, the FA is, is starting to look a little more shaky. Um, and then he gets to the point that um, uh, David Cody himself um, basically took issue with appeals to the FAE um, and pointed out in his paper one of the things, as we said, that often there are, you can look at when people appeal to the fundamental attribution era, there's often, you can often sort of point to dispositional issues that lead them to come to that conclusion in the first place and often you could make the case that people who overly appeal to the FAE are in fact committing the fundamental attribution error themselves um, and says that you know it's there's always a mixture of situation and disposition and it's quite murky as to as to um, exactly how much of each is in play at any one time um, so to the point where he says uh, where Clark says Cody is of course right that possible explanations of behaviour should appeal to a combination of situation and dispositions. This sensible view is not disputed by me or even by staunch situationists such as Ross, and my apologies to readers if the brief sketch of the case for the FAE presented in his previous paper led them to think otherwise. So um, it's, it's, starting, it's starting to look a little more shaky for the fundamental attribution error, does this mean then that his paper, his initial view in his paper, is becoming more and more shaky? Well, so therein lies the issue, because Steve wants to have it that he was wrong to rely heavily on the FAA, but at the same time he still thinks he's largely right if we make certain assumptions. Mm. So he doesn't while, while he admits that the FAE is less cut and dried, uh, less absolute than it certainly appeared as he presented it in his original paper, um, he doesn't think this, uh, that this invalidates his previous argument, especially if you cast his argument as the important, the, 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 the important factor that explains why people cling to unwarranted conspiracy theories is not to do with conspiracy theories themselves, it's to do with the psychology of the conspiracy theorists. Um, now, he says that there are, it, it's not a problem in one of two ways. Either you could say that, okay, the fundamental attribution error isn't as widespread as we thought, uh, but that simply shows that these conspiracy theorists who are committing the fundamental attribution error are the exception to the rule, which is kind of what we thought anyway. Um, so there's, he sort of, he has that as, as one possibility, or then he admits, okay, but, but, or maybe, maybe the FAE 
just doesn't apply. Maybe the whole project is wrong. Um, but in that case, he still suggests that it's another psychological factor that's behind their behavior. He says, I argue that the apparent implausibility of those conspiracy theories that are popularly propounded is best explained by appealing to the psychology of conspiracy theorists. Um, I, I don't, I sort of get to this point and I'm like, well, I don't know enough about psychology to say either way. Do philosophers know enough about psychology to say either way? Or should we just leave this to the psychologists? Wow. So a lot of this does depend on your definitions, because the assumption that Clark relies upon for this conclusion that either the FAE is in play, but conspiracy theorists are the exception rather than the rule, or there is some other psychological explanation which is able to explain why people believe conspiracy theories, is kind of based upon this line he has that, look, conspiracy theorists are in the minority for now, and that for now part is important. So he's going, look, we're restricting talk of belief in conspiracy theories to a very small, uh, so pro problematic belief in conspiracy theories, to a very small set of people, the pejoratively labelled conspiracy theorists, which we can see with our examples of, say, your David Icke's, your Alex Joneses, your Billy T.K. Jr., and the like. And we need to explain why it is that they are unusual and weird, and the best way to do that is via their psychology. But that requires you to buy into a pejorative gloss as to who counts as being a conspiracy theorist. If you open the franchise of conspiracy theorists, just anyone who believes in a conspiracy theory, this psychological account isn't going to work because there's warranted belief in conspiracy theories and there are examples of things which were labeled as conspiracy theories and thus the people who believed them labeled as conspiracy theorists that turned out to be things we ought to have believed in the first instance. So we can kind of sidestep the do we need to engage with the psychologists here by going actually an awful lot is reliant upon who counts as being a conspiracy theorist in this particular type of argument. Hmm. Now, would it be fair to say that um, Clark is, is a generalist rather than a particularist? I mean, he certainly seems to be saying that the content of the conspiracy theories is almost irrelevant next to the category of people who believe in them. I would say that Clark actually still is a particularist in so far that he does believe that conspiracy theories can be warranted. He is a kind of generalist when it comes to conspiracy theorists. So he does take it that whilst we can't, we can't just assume things about things which are labelled as conspiracy theories because conspiracies occur, he is willing to bite the bullet and say, if you've been labelled as a conspiracy theorist, then that is a general class of people who act irrationally. So, and the reason why I say this is, I know Steve, I've corresponded with Steve. At one point earlier this year, we were working on a research proposal around COVID-19 conspiracy theories. And I thus know what he thinks about the conspiracy theories as opposed to the conspiracy theorists. He was willing to work with me on a project looking at how we analyze COVID-19 conspiracy theories to try and have an evidential debate about which ones we ought to take seriously and which ones we might have a rationale for putting to one side. So I don't think he can end up being a generalist about conspiracy theories, but I do think he ends up being a generalist about these people called conspiracy theorists. Mm. Because I do recall from his previous paper, he said at the end something to the effect of, and it's probably worth putting up with all these degenerative research programs and so on, because eventually they do come up with one that is real and it's important that we find out about these real things like Watergate. Um, so am I, am, am, I, am I inviting spoilers if I say um, how have things gone from here? Have his views 
evolved much? Have have people responded to things, or will we get into these those responses in the fullness of time? Well, we're not going to see much more of Clark. We're going to see one more paper by Clark: conspiracy theories and controlled. Uh, sorry, conspiracy theories and the internet, which then has a subtitle about controlled demolition, which is actually going to be an analysis of how conspiracy theories have done in the online world. But by and large, after that, Steve kind of leaves the literature. But I do believe he's quite keen to get back into it. And I say that because I did invite him to be a contributor to Taking Conspiracy Theories Seriously, published back in 2018. And initially he was quite keen. And then he did some background reading and went, look, I need to do more reading of the current state of the literature before I can contribute. But I think he's quite interested mm. in doing that. So, so we'll have one more paper by Clark, and I suspect we'll have more papers by Clark in future. Mm, well, there you go. Now, that one references controlled demolition, so I assume at that point people have finally started talking about 9-11 in earnest. Oh, yes. Mm. And actually, there's a actually... very interesting comparison between 9-11 and JFK conspiracy theories. Mm. I actually... I. I finally found out the other day, uh, Loose Change came out in 2007. So even this paper, which is published in a book in 2006, predates the, the, the documentary that really now, started the... Which version of Loose Change? Is that the first edition of Loose Change? I think it, I, I assume it was. There's at least three. Mm. Yeah, okay, that's a point. Yes, I just read a thing that talked about Loose Change, which came out in 2007, but I, I assume that must be the first one. But loose change was the certainly final cut the, uh... has narration by Charlie Shane. Mm. Back when he was famous. Yes, loose change being sort of the the pandemic, I guess, uh, of um, of nine eleven, which really really kicked things off. But anyway, that is it. Uh, for appealing to the fundamental attribution era, was it all a big mistake? And and in. Um, in keeping with the fact that supposedly any um, any headline, any title you read that has a question in it can always be answered with no, uh, that's pretty much what, what Steve Clark does. So good, I guess. No surprises. Indeed. So that does bring us to an end of another exciting episode of Conspiracy Theory Masterpiece Theatre. So for those of you who aren't patrons, you'll need to wait until next week for what might be an exciting instalment of the podcaster's guide to the conspiracy. But for our patrons, well, we've got some humdinger material for you. We'll be talking about David Farrier, talking about Dylan Reeve, talking about the originator of a dodgy COVID-19 outbreak rumor in this country. We'll be hearing from Byron Clark about Kerry Bolton recording yet another podcast episode with Action Zelandia. We'll be checking in on the Senate Intelligence Committee report on Russian interference in the last US election, which has some startling conclusions for fans of Donald Trump. We'll be asking questions about why Jerry Brownlee continues to ask questions. And finally, there's a brand new birth affair. Bur I can't say it. Finally, there's a brand new Bertha theory in US politics. Also, I've just suddenly realised in the notes, I haven't written Jerry Brownlee, I've written Jerry Brownless. Jerry Brownless? Well, I mean, that's true, I guess. Not much not much brown on him that I'm aware of. No, he's actually one of the whitest men of he all is time. A, he's quite a white person. Uh, yes, so... If you're a patron, stick around, and um, you can you can get into some of that straight away. If you're not a patron but you'd like to be one, then go to Patreon and look for the podcaster's guide to the conspiracy, and that would be just peachy. It'd it be, would indeed. Mm, happy to have you on board. Uh, not only would you get access to these uh, bonus episodes, you can also go on our Discord and send us messages and, and basically tell us what to do and how to run our lives, essentially. I'm pretty sure you, you get that right once you've um, once you've signed up as a patron. Um, you can even actually listen in to live to the recording of these episodes and find out about all the crap that we do in between takes and 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 and, fi and find out when we mess stuff up and have to do it again. We ca we can't hide anything from you. So um, yeah, I, 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 that's the that's the best selling of it I can do. I think um, you've convinced me. 
if I mean, if it made sense to contribute to my own podcast, I'd be in with mm. a quid. But if I haven't convinced you and you don't want to become a patron, that's fine also. We're, we're quite happy to just have you as, as our audience, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but to you, our audience, um, we have no more to say this week. I think that was quite a quick episode, wasn't it? Like, like we said, well, short and sweet. Actually, it's still going to be around about 40 minutes in length. Oh, well, there we go. We, we do like to waffle, don't we? We do. Um, well, let, let's cut it short anyway, no matter, no matter the final length. Uh, call things to a close and simply say goodbye from me. And it's hello from me. Mm. Confronting. You've been listening to the podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, starring Josh Addison and Dr. M.R. Extenter which is written, researched, recorded, and produced by Josh and M. You can support the podcast by becoming a patron via its Podbean or Patreon campaigns. And if you need to get in contact with either Josh or M, you can email them at podcastconspiracy at gmail.com or check their Twitter accounts, Monkey Fluids and Conspiracism. December, what a night. All right, hang on, let me just scroll back up to the top there. <coughs> you, could, you could have put one more in there. <coughs> That's much better. Hmm.